Okay, so let's pick back up with respiratory. Uh, the main problem with all these <coughs> respiratory problems is that uh, they have a VQ mismatch. V stands for ventilation and the Q stands for perfusion. So ventilation, ventilation is uh, defined by the amount of air from the outside to the inside, right? So if you ventilating the patient, it's the amount of air that is coming from the outside going to the inside. Where they get perfusion or, uh oh, old moment, ventilation, perfusion, or respiration, right? You have ventilation and respiration, okay? Perfusion is the same as respiration. Respiration is the process of taking the air from the alveolus into the rest of the body, okay, and distributing the rest throughout the rest of the body. So you have a ventilation where they can't get air in, or you have a perfusion problem where they can't use the air that, uh, that, that they get in. Which makes sense to everybody? I mean, so you have one of those two problems with that. And then just here's a little picture, you see the normal, and then all of a sudden you have a, a blockage or something, an airway obstruction, or this dead space uh, where there's a pulmonary embolism. So the normal blood, normal airflow, we, we ventilate, we take air in, and then through the process of respiration, goes into the uh, alveolus, into the capillary bed, and then that air is distributed back uh, through the rest of the uh, rest of the body, that oxygen, right? If we have an obstruction there, then the air can't get in, or if we have something like a pulmonary embolism, <clears throat> there's a blockage there and it can't, uh, can't use it. It can't be distributed to the rest of the body. So those are the major problems with any, any sort of respiratory things that we look at. When we look at respiratory problems, we look at inadequate breathing. But to know what's normal, or abnormal, we have to know what's normal first, right? So to know what's inadequate, we have to know what's adequate. So no obvious distress. There's no uh, work of breathing here. The patient's not working to breathe. They have the ability to speak in full sentence, sentences. I'm having a stroke, I think. <laughs> sentence, sentence, okay. Full sentences, oh my God. <laughs> Okay, you got, the, you got the term, talking hard. So the ability to speak in, in, like right now, I'm not having any trouble breathing. I'm having trouble speaking, but not breathing uh, because I'm talking multiple words per breath. And in, in a respiratory problem, this is sort of the way that you evaluate it. Like on chest pain, you evaluate it on a, on a scale of one to 10. Here with a respiratory problem, you would evaluate on how many words the patient could say before they needed a breath. It would be something like this. If I'm having trouble breathing, it would be more like, I can't breathe because every other word, I have to take a breath, okay? Then, so a, a ability to speak uh, multiple words before you have to take a breath. I'm not even trying to say that word again. Okay. Normal color, so they're warm, pink, dry, normal mental status, right? So this is what is nor adequate, adequate breathing, good rise and fall of the chest, symmetrical rise and fall of the chest, good tidal volume. Remember the tidal volume is the amount of air that the patient breathes in with, in, with in, one inspiration. And that average tidal volume for an adult is 500 uh, mLs, right? So they breathe in on average of 500 mLs uh, of air with ventilation. It's a normal tidal volume. So I got good symmetrical rise and fall of the chest. I have good tidal volume uh, and no obvious distress. If you want to add SpO2 on there, the SpO2 is you know, 95 to 100%, so it's normal, right? Adequate breathing. The rate is also important. If you note that 
the adult rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute and it gets faster as a child or infant so uh, it is important to note that like in test taking because the fact that they may give you a, a scenario with an infant where their respiratory rate is 40 well instead of hitting the panic button over that we know that that's normal so that's a normal respiratory rate uh, for an infant the rhythm in and out at a rhythm uh, a nice you know uh, good rise and fall of the chest it's uh, it's called I to E time on event but we also have an I to E time inspiration and expiration so we breathe out we breathe in over two seconds two to and we breathe out over one second so we have an I to E time inspiration two seconds and expiration one second so a normal I to E time is two to one and then the breath sounds are clear we just talked in CHF about those rails and ronchi. They're clear, they're good, they sound normal, normal breath sounds, and they're equal on uh, both sides. Difficulty breathing, it is subjective. The patient can tell you, hey, I'm having trouble breathing, I can't get air in, right? You see that the patient is uh, breathe, having trouble breathing, uh, it doesn't take someone in medicine to look at someone and say, hey, I think they're having trouble breathing, right? So the, uh, they're having some sort of distress. So believe, believe your patient, you know, when they tell you uh, that they're having trouble breathing. When we're doing our OPQRST, it's very much the same. So when did it begin? Provocation. What were you doing when this shortness of breath came on, right? Do you have a cough? It, is it productive? Are you coughing anything up? So these are the things that you would look at. This provocation is very important. You know, like with an asthmatic, what were you doing? Oh, I was trying to run a 10K, right? There you go. Uh, probably not so a wise idea. A uh, cough, like in a pneumonia maybe or something that they have, that, and they have a productive cough, discoloration of the cough, or the sputum. Is there any pain anywhere else in the body? And again, just like we talked about, instead of using this one to 10 uh, words per breath as a better indicator in sort of how long has this, uh, have you been having this trouble breathing? So it's, it's the same, it's the same sort of OPQRST and sample that we've been using. Okay? It just varies just slightly. So observation wise, do they have an altered mental status? Are they A and O time, you know, normal is A and O person, place, time, and event? Right? Do they, uh, because of hypoxia, is, do they have an uh, altered mental status? They have this unusual anatomy, this in emphysema, it's very common. You can pick them out at Walmart. You go through Walmart find people that are diabetics because they don't have any toes or you know uh, or extremities you can pick out emphysema patients because they're this big old skinny barrel chest okay and you can pick out chronic bronchitis patients because they're sort of overweight and they're sweaty and they're sort of grayish looking right okay so the you can you can start uh, picking those people out that have these different uh, COPDs because the fact that the way that they look. Is the patient tripoding? We just sort of uh, mentioned that with CHF. Are they leaning forward uh, to try to get more air into their uh, thoracic cavity? Trying to open that thoracic cavity up. Retractions, neck retractions, are they breathing? Do you see uh, retractions in the neck that they're breathing tracheal tugging that they're sort of uh, they sort of do, do this like right, right and they, they get this retraction in their neck are they using accessory muscles or abdominal breathing do they are they belly breathing is that belly 
you know, concaving in, especially on a pediatric patient, but can you see their abdomen moving up and down and they're using that? Pursed lips, we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, pursed lips is like you guys taking pictures, right? When you, you do those duck lips, when you get, take the picture, right? The pursed lips, what this does is it, uh, it provides PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, or it keeps the air sacs open uh, longer. And we'll speak of that in just a minute. I got a picture. Okay. And then number of words they can say. Cyanosis, remember, cyanosis is a late sign. Do they have edema, pedal edema, sacral edema in the lower back? Or the, or the coughing, these are things that you would uh, observe and find out during your assessment. And then, are they making different sounds? You know, a strider is an upper respiratory uh, obstruction, like through mucus. It, it sounds to me, strider sounds to me like a lot of times they're trying to cough up that lug. Or well, if you listen to Germans talk, how harsh they sort of talk, ah, right, ah, it's, it's that sort of harsh respiratory sound. Gurgling is the sound of fluid. The wheeze, we can have audible wheezes. That wheeze that we hear is through constriction. So that airway is constricted. And in the COPDs, uh, including asthma, it's constricted by the bronchial constriction but usually that's because there's fluid, there's mucus in there, and that's what's causing the constriction. Audible wheezing, we can just hear that without a stethoscope. Uh, a lot of times on these patients that you have expiratory wheeze, uh, they can get air in, but they can't get air out, it traps, and so you get a, an expiratory wheeze. And then we always wanna auscultate lung sounds. When we auscultate lung sounds, just as in the picture, it's better to actually listen to the back. You, you pick up more sound in the, as you listen to the back, but you compare the, uh, the apex of the lungs or the top. Remember, the apex is the shape, not necessarily the location so the apex of the lung or the heart is here at the bottom because of the because of the shape okay so the apex of the lung is up at the top top part the base of the lungs are at the bottom and so the base of the heart is at the top it's just opposite but it's it's due to the shape so when we auscultate lung sounds we want to auscultate uh, not only the bases, but uh, up top, but also the uh, the apexes or down in the bottom. And you listen to one side, and you compare the side of one side to the to the other side. Okay. In wheezes, crackles. We've we've already talked about all this, uh, so we'll move on. Changes in SpO2, you'll see that. Not necessarily right away. This patient, like an asthmatic patient, is going to have a good SpO2 for a long period of time. Uh, same way with the emphysema patient, because air trapping, they get air in, just can't get air out. So the, uh, the SpO2 is not something that changes right away. The patient's gonna have difficulty breathing long before their SpO2 changes. So that's something that uh, to keep in mind. What you're going to see right away is an increase in rate, respiratory rate. They're trying to compensate with an increase in respiratory rate. You're going to see an increase in uh, pulse rate as well. Blood pressure may, uh, it's usually, high, they're usually hypertensive because of the fact that they're having trouble breathing. They're in distress, a little anxiety there. So we're gonna, we're gonna evaluate the need for oxygen always, but these pa 
patients who are in outward respiratory distress, we're going to administer oxygen to them, all right? Uh, and we'll get into the sort of the more, the, the other treatment in, in just a few minutes, okay? Oh, well, no, let's get into it now. So we're gonna oxygenate them, okay? So we're gonna uh, use a non-rebreather because the fact that they're gonna be mouth breathing. If they're in severe respiratory distress, they're gonna be breathing through their mouth. If they're not mouth breathing, we can use a nasal cannula. Okay. Uh, Non-rebreather, 10 to 15 liters per minute. Remember that in the nasal cannula, uh, two to six liters per minute. Uh, place to position the patient, the place of comfort. We may uh, look at administering them uh, albuterol. It's one of the medications. Albuterol is a beta uh, two agonist. It, it, the class of albuterol is a bronchodilator. It bronchodilates, but it bronchodilates by relaxation. So it's a uh, the the family that albuterol in is in a beta two agonist. Remember, we have beta two molecules. Uh, which affect the lungs. Uh, so a, a beta-2 medication is a medication that's going to cause uh, bronchodilation. Uh, a beta-1 molecule, a beta-1 one medication is going to affect the, the, uh, the heart. Because we have one heart, beta-1, beta-2, two, two lungs. So a beta-1 medication, as in Albuterol is a beta-1 medication because it's going, it will increase the heart rate because it is a beta-1 and co so a beta-1 medication is going to increase the heart rate. So this albuterol that you administer with this patient that's uh, wheezing, typically it's going to be the, the biggest thing. We get that obstruction in there. And so uh, we know by administering that medication, by either a, a prescribed inhaler, we wouldn't necessarily do that, but we would do a, a nebulized treatment. So we'd set that nebulized treatment up and that uh, set it at about six liters per minute. We'd have to instruct the patient on making, sort of breathe that in, breathe deep, try to hold that in a little bit, hold your breath, and then let that medication work. But we know because of the beta properties of of albuterol that is going to increase the heart rate, but it should also cause bronchodilation. If that doesn't work, we can uh, administer CPAP, continuous positive pressure, uh, continuous positive airway pressure. What CPAP is, it's a big mask. It looks like the, uh, the CHF, I mean the, the bag valve mask. Let me get it right quick. CPAP is very useful because uh, prior to CPAP, we intubated these patients instead of putting them on CPAP. It, the, it's a big mask, it does fit uh, over the head and it fits tight like the, uh, the bag valve mask does. Your patient that you're placing CPAP on has to be alert and oriented. They can't have a decreased mental status, okay? And so we put the CPAP on here on this gauge. Here that uh, we turn it, we'd start about six. It's measured in centimeters of water. It's like millimeters of mercury. It's just a measurement. But we apply this to oxygen and turn to where that gauge is about six. We'd start there. And it forces air into the lungs. And it forces air into those alveolus to help open them up, OK? CPAP is a great thing uh, that came out. The, there's different size masks, the same way with the uh, bag valve mask, but it does fit firmly over the face. It's almost like it, uh, it, it just sort of suffocate them. The patient feels a little like they're suffocating a little bit. 
but they do have to be alert and oriented for uh, CPAP. Okay, so when we look at emphysema, the COPDs that we're going to look at, we'll probably uh, just do emphysema this time. So when we look at emphysema, uh, it's a breakdown of the wall of the alveoli. It reduces the uh, surface area because of the fact that you have all this mucus and it uh, reduces the elasticity of the lungs. The lungs, because of elastin, can expand and contract with emphysema and a typical case is that, that chain smoker, right? It destroys the elastin. Those toxins that are in the cigarette destroy elastin. And then you get this problem here where you have a lot of mucus production. We'll explain that in just a second. And through that mucus production, now we have the sort of the same problem with CHF is diffusion takes place but also it thins down the bronchial and we get air trapping uh, as well. There's my picture that one. So when we look up here in the corner, uh, this is off a Khan Academy video on emphysema. Uh, if you want to catch the full version of it. Right? What happens is here He's drawn the, uh, the airway, the alveoli, right? and these yellow places here are mucus, and these green parts are called goblet cells. They represent goblet cells. On a, uh, a regular person, non-emphysema patient, those uh, airways, those bronchioles are tethered. This is what Khan is trying to draw over here. He's drawing a little tethering effect. So those, those airways are attached to the pleura in this tethering effect. And so when we breathe in, okay, because of this tethering effect, it pulls that airway open. Make sense? Okay, it sort of pulls it open. So it's tethered to the pleura uh, lining the lung, the, the visceral pleura. And then that visceral pleura is tethered to the parietal pleura that lines the thoracic cavity. And so when we breathe in, it pulls that airway open. Through the process of this chronic smoking, this tethering effect is destroyed. Okay, so you don't get the tethering effect over a length of time. Now this this emphysema patient is not the one, okay, the 17-year-old, you know, that's having trouble breathing. Okay, this is the 60-year-old man, you know, having trouble breathing type thing. It's not a, a young person necessarily in like in a test question. So you lose that tethering effect uh, uh, with the, so the airway doesn't open up as much. The other thing that emphysema does is with the goblet cells. I'll start sort of back up top. What the toxins or the, the stuff that's in the cigarette smoking, that chronic cigarette smoking does, is it destroys the microvilli or the villi. On each one of these goblet cells is a little small hair. And what it does is, in a normal person, these hairs move all the time like this. So anything in the lungs except oxygen is toxic. So we go outside, even in the great state of Texas, we have pollution, right? And so the, uh, we, these, my, these villi get these irritants, this dust and everything else, and they sort of push them up to the top and we either spit them out or swallow them, right? But they get pushed up to the top. What takes place in this emphysema patient is that these villi are destroyed in these microvilli, the microvilli is just another hair that's on the end of the villi, okay, are destroyed. So that explains that smoker's cough. So when that patient wakes up in the morning, because of this, uh, these villi not working, they, they get a cough and they cough and cough, right? The other thing that makes them cough is it, uh, Cigarette smoking damages the goblet cells. 
It causes them to overproduce. We normally produce about a liter of sputum a day. We just swallow most of it back, right? And so the, uh, what happens is it causes uh, the, the, the chronic smoking causes these goblet cells to overproduce mucus. So you get this excessive mucus down in here uh, through the goblet cells and then you can't get rid of the irritants that's in the lung so you produce this cough and you get this constriction because of all the mucus. The other thing, because of the fact that down in here in the, the smaller, smaller airways, getting closer to the alveolus, you get fluid down there, or that thick mucus down in there, okay, and you get air trapping. So the air comes in, gets in, but it traps out. On the next slide, I'll show you the sort of like a paper bag. The alveolus is, and I don't have my paper sack around anymore, but the, if you take a paper sack and you throw it up in the air and you pull it down, you know how it opens up like that, okay? The, uh, in a smoker or somebody with emphysema, and it's not primarily smoking, there's other people that get emphysema that don't smoke, but smoking is the number one cause. Okay. So you, the air sacs become like little little flat sacks. It's, it's like laying that, that uh, sack on a table now. It flattens out. It's not that nice, full, thick uh, round where there's air flowing through it. And it traps the air. Not only does it trap the air, it traps the carbon dioxide. Okay? So, all this, and, and I failed to mention something I wanted to with the tethering effect in review. Remember, we breathe on a negative pressure, okay? Uh, if I'm ventilating a patient, I'm breathing positive pressure. I'm pushing air in. But we normally breathe on negative pressure, and that's because of this tethering effect. Uh, it pulls that open, okay? So the biggest problems here, and uh, like we said, before the, the cigarette smoking and everything else uh, destroys the elastin or the elasticity. So the major problems with emphysema is the overproduction of mucus because the damage to the, the villi and the goblet cells, air trapping, okay, and then uh, the decrease of or the destroy where it destroys the tether, the tethering effect. Any, any questions there? That's a lot, but that's what happens in emphysema. And that sort of happens, the sort of the same thing happens with chronic bronchitis. So we look here at our picture, and we talk about this barrel chest that we mentioned before. You, the, over time, the patients get the, that barrel chest due to hyperinflation of the lungs. They're trying so hard to breathe that they hyperinflate the lungs and it gives the anatomy sort of this braille chest look. Uh, uh, like I said, it, it destroys the uh, elastin so the, the lungs become more rigid and they can't expand. Hence the, the difficulty and they're trying to get these lungs to expand, okay? And then with the uh, pursed lips, Khan does a good example here uh, with the door opening. What happens in with the air trapping is the door shuts too fast, okay, or it's, it doesn't stay open long enough to get the air out. What these pursed lips do, okay, is it creates a uh, human peep. Peep is positive end, like the end of the story, the end of this long video, positive end expiratory pressure. And what PEEP does, you can add PEEP to a bag valve mask, you can add PEEP to a, a ventilator, okay? Uh, emphysema patients with those pursed lips, they add PEEP by 
pursing those lips or pushing those lips out and what it does is it allows that door or that alveolus to stay open longer so they can get that air out. Great video to watch. Uh, he explains it much better than, than I do. Uh, on Khan Academy, it's like the pathophysiology of COPD or something like that. All right, so we've talked about most of this, so we're not going to go back through it. But when we look at uh, COPD, it's an expiratory problem. Okay? We breathe in negative pressure, and uh, just like we stated, through the long process and the destruction of the way that the natural uh, the lungs work and the and the thorax works, uh, we lose that. Okay, without elastin, elastin is what helps the lungs recool back to their normal shape, uh, and the loss of this, the loss of this elastin is like the uh, plastic bag that we talked about, because what happens with the the chronic cigarette smoking is. Uh, it produces elastase, okay, which is sort of this inflammation process, uh, and it affects its irritants and the mucus and the goblet cells, but the elastin is destroyed by the elastase. Okay? And then we talked about the tethering effect. The elastin depends upon you know, this tethering effect. Without the tethering effect, those airways become flat and we uh, we get air trapping the barrel chest and the pursed lips we just we just sort of talked about chronic bronchitis is most all this so you can just mul multiply this <coughs> and reproduce this with chronic bronchitis patient the treatment is the same as well however the thing that you're going to see in a chronic bronchitis patient is the fever uh, and their presentation like we spoke up before uh, just historically I've seen the chronic bronchitis patients they're more heavy set they're overweight they have a sort of a, a grayish tint to them because of a, you know a little sort of chronic type of hypoxia so they have a gray look to them but these guys are going to have fever, especially in a test question. You're going to get this. Uh, you're going to have to discern in testing between emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma, and pneumonia. Uh, you're going to have to discern the differences between those two. Okay. But typically it's fever. You have to be careful because you also have fever in a pneumonia patient. But the signs and symptoms, when we get to pneumonia, uh, not necessarily today, but when we get to pneumonia, uh, we'll talk about the differences between chronic bronchitis and pneumonia. There's distinct uh, differences between the two. The treatment's this very similar, the beta-2 agonist like we talked about. In the hospital or on the ALS side, they're going to give them steroids to reduce the inflammation over a period of time. Uh, they're going to do pulmonary function checks and to see how they're breathing. And then uh, antibiotics for the chronic bronchitis patient, CPAP, uh, if they're alert and oriented. These are just these are just normal values that I want to throw up there right quick before we end. Uh, <clears throat> also with this emphysema patient, chronic bronchitis patient, pneumonia patient, probably asthma patient, they're going to do arterial blood gases in the hospital. They're going to draw, uh, they, they insert a needle into an artery and they draw blood out to check their uh, arterial blood gas. Remember the SpO2 
it's a partial pressure of oxygen in a capillary bed. Okay? This, with the arterial blood gas, they check uh, oxygen in the blood, which is PO2, partial pressure of oxygen. So the PO2 is arterial blood, the amount of oxygen in arterial blood, which is 80 to 100. Uh, it will check PCO2. It's going to check the carbon dioxide level, which is the normal PCO2 is 35 to 45. They will also check a bicarbonate. What bicarbonate in the bloodstream does is it acts as a, uh, a buffer for if, we, if the patient becomes acidic. So if the patient becomes acidic, like metabolic acidosis, don't have time for that, but if they have metabolic acidosis, the bicarb system or the buffer system is going to release bicarbonate into the bloodstream to try to get that pH back under control. Uh, if we can't do that because the buffer system is very small, then the, we have to administer bicarbonate if they have like a metabolic acidosis, if they're acidic. And then the blood pH 7.35 to 7.45. So if this patient has a pH, a blood pH of seven, then the buffer system is going to release, and that's hypothetical numbers, but it's going to release bicarbonate into the bloodstream to adjust for the, the acidity. PCO2, what happens with, with the increase, so we have a patient with the PCO2 of 50, let's say, so their, carb their CO2 levels are high, what you're going to see right away is the patient's going to increase their respiration. That's the, it's called blowing off the CO2. So they're going to increase the respiration. The body's going to increase respiration to try to get rid of that CO2. If we have a patient that is unresponsive with a high S or CO2, we can hyperventilate the patient if if we're monitoring the end tidal CO2. And we have to monitor that before we start hyperventilating the patient. But if they have a high CO2 and we're monitoring the end tidal CO2, we can hyperventilate this patient and decrease the CO2. Okay. Any questions there? And that took longer than I stopped, thought to. Okay, we'll stop.